John chapter 11, we're going to look at the story of Lazarus today as we start this series called Rise Up. And again, like I said, I haven't been this excited to preach about a topic for a while or a passage in a while, and so we're going to dive into it. If you look at our mission as a church, where our passionate mission for years has been engaging every person to become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. Every church has the same mission from Matthew 28, but it's expressed in different ways, and the way it's expressed here is engaging every person, reaching out to every person, no matter who they are, to become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Over the past five years, we've had a vision, and what's the difference between mission and vision? Mission is who we are. It's the very DNA of what we do, but a vision is how that's accomplished in a certain period of time, how God leads us as a congregation to accomplish something. And so we've been talking about immeasurably more. And so over the past five years, which have been challenging years in the world around us, have been challenging years uh, just in general, in culture, in the world, and all that kind of stuff, but God called us in the midst of that challenging season to immeasurably more. Our prayer was to see God unleash a spirit-empowered movement through kingdom multiplication while experiencing the fullness of Jesus Christ in holy moments. And God has brought about so many things over these past several years. In the midst of the challenge, we've seen God meet with us incredible ways. And and part of that, just not the whole thing, but part of that was coming to the end of this death that's been around this church for decades now. And by God's grace, we're making our way towards that by the end of this year, our hope and prayer, believing that God's going to erase that debt and lead us into a whole new season of what God might have for us that way. But through all kinds of other things, raising up leaders, continuing to experience the multiplication that would happen in, in people's lives. And, and recently, I, I was woken up in the middle of the night to make this list of both challenges and blessings and hopes and dreams. And you know, the funny thing about life for each one of us is we don't have to discipline our mind to find challenges, right? Challenges just come, and we constantly are focused on the things that might be going wrong But I discipline my mind to think about the blessings even from this past summer as I've looked back at these past couple months and also the hopes and dreams for what I believe God wants to continue to do in our family's life and the church's life. And you know what was interesting about that list? By the end of that uh, time that I spent with the Lord, all three of those lists were the same length. The blessings, the challenges, the hopes and dreams. That God is working in the midst of every challenge, that there are challenges, but God is working in the midst of it. And so even as I look past this summer, just some of the blessings that God has brought about with uh, Peter and Krisha joining the team, the Gabuchis joining the team, and this launch of this after-school program with Encore. If I heard right, it was 25 to 30 families gathered together for the launch of our after-school program that's starting in the fall. What a cool way to reach out to our community that God put on the hearts of people in our church. Our lay resident, Trisha, joining the team and seeing the ways that she's working around here. Again, these debt payments coming in June that helped us start the goal to getting towards the end of that. Some impactful events this summer, Rise and Big Serve at the beginning of the summer. We had Rock the Block a couple weeks ago. We had Mega Camp. I think over 160 students participating in Mega Camp. I'm hopeful that you also, despite the... I, I talk to people and say, man, the summer's been crazy. I hope that you have experienced holy moments in your life this past year and even this summer, because that's been our focus this year, immeasurably more holy moments. How is God going to meet? How are we going to experience the fullness of Jesus Christ in holy moments? But like I said, there's, there's also challenges as well. And the interesting question I had is with holy moments, we want to experience the grace of God. We want to experience meeting with God in a powerful way that we can say, I've met with the God of the universe. But what happens when in those situations in our lives, the things that we've been praying for go from bad to worse. Because I'm assuming if you've walked with Jesus at all, or even if you've reached out to him in any way, I'm sure there's been times where, yes, you've had answers to prayer and you've experienced God in powerful ways. But I also bet there's a lot of times where things happen where things don't go from bad to good, they go from bad to worse. And in your notes there, if you want to take notes, I just listed a couple of the ways that this happened. Some questions that I think are on the minds of many people as we think about holy moments. What happens when the prayers we pray don't seem to be answered? What happens when the prayers we pray don't seem to be answered? Some of us have prayed for the same thing for years, for help with financial challenges, for changes to relationships, for people to love that we love to come to know Jesus, for life circumstances to change. What happens when the prayers we pray don't seem to get answered? What happens when the things that we hoped would change either don't change or they get worse? 
uh, towards the beginning of this summer, uh, we have you know a decent chunk of property, so we have to we have a riding mower that uh, Judah actually has started to mow the lawn, which is awesome. You know, like I'm not even making him; he's just mowing the lawn. It's it's been a huge blessing to me. But all of a sudden, the mower dies one day, and so I have to change the head gasket on the mower, and then it keeps going again. And I'm I'm feeling good about myself because I don't know much about mowers, and I fixed it, going again, and all of a sudden it dies again. And let me tell you, I've changed about every part on that mower at this point. Right? And, and up until this week, I was just like, I have no idea. It's been like three or four weeks since we've had a mower to mow our property. Uh, thankfully, I had a friend that was able to look at it the other day. And because I'm, I'm praying that something I did actually made a difference. But who knows? At least he came over and he was help, helping me to get it started. So finally, praise the Lord, my mower got started. It's a small thing, but it's something, right? But then we got here yesterday before Saturday night service. And one of our van doors broke. Uh, on the other side, and all of a sudden we got out and we're closing the door, and all of a sudden that one snapped and that van door broke. And I don't know if you've had these moments. I feel like every mechanical thing I own has just broken this summer. You know, it's a, it's a terrible feeling. It's it's a silly thing because there's much more important things in life. But what happens when the things we hope would change don't change? They get worse. Like my mower, it got worse. It didn't get better. What happens when everything we look at seems hopeless or lost? When everything we look at seems hopeless or lost. I want to give a huge shout out to our ministry partners at the chapel uh, this week because this week we have a relatively new soundboard and then the team came in this week to get ready for service and all of a sudden there was a really bad sign on the soundboard and the whole thing just died. And there was no way we could even get sound in the speakers for this weekend. And so grateful to have partners like the chapel that showed up. And within a couple hours, they had an extra soundboard they were able to lend us for a couple weeks as we get this fixed. What happens, though, in those moments? At that very moment, we're like, oh, my goodness, are we even going to have speakers this week to be able to have our service? What happens when those things just see like we are in this place? How could things possibly get worse? And, and when I look personally in our lives, sometimes these things happen. Seem, things seem hopeless. When I look at the world around us, you look at the political situation, the cultural changes, the wars we're in. Sometimes you look around, you're like, oh my goodness, this just seems hopeless or lost. How are we ever going to redeem the culture? How's it ever going to get back to a place where it could be healthy? Finally, what happens when life feels less like holy moments and more like a dark night of the soul? St. John of the Cross wrote a book called The Dark Night of the Soul. And, and he basically was pointing out that sometimes in life, it's not that something's wrong with us, that we're sinning a lot, but that God just seems distant. And even if you believe in God and you're trying to serve him, you just don't feel close to him. You don't feel like you're being transformed. You don't see the progress in your spiritual life. Now, in your notes there, I put, what are our normal responses to these questions? Because I, I believe that there's some normal responses we might have. One of them is when prayers don't seem to get answered, we doubt. When prayers don't seem to get answered, we doubt. We say, is God who he says he is? Does God really, really love me? Does he really want to answer my prayers? When things we hoped would change don't change, we get confused. You say, is it something with me? Is there there a reason that God won't change my circumstance? How long can I keep going this way? When when things seem hopeless or lost, we either rationalize or we give up. To rationalize, to, to come up with a logical, plausible reason for why these things are happening, even if it's not true. And why is that dangerous? It's it's when we say, well, it must be this, or God must be trying to do this. And the problem is, sometimes when we rationalize, we're not actually experiencing the feeling of what's going on in the midst of that situation. We're not truly acknowledging the pain. We're just trying to rationalize around it. Or for many of the rest of us, we get in these situations and we just give up. And, And I think there's some here today that in essence you have kind of given up. It's not that you've stopped doing maybe the right things. It's not that you haven't stop showing up to certain things or loving people in certain ways, but in essence, in your heart, you've kind of given up. Even if I talk to young families in particular, as their schedules are out of control and crazy, and they're just, at some point, they're just kind of like, I don't even know what to do. Like, I just kind of give up. I don't know what to do next. And so I was wrestling through some of these questions and thoughts recently, and I started to see John 11, the story of Lazarus, in a new way. If any of you have watched The Chosen Uh, This past season focused around the story of Lazarus. And as I was watching that, I went back to study the passage and I approached the teaching team. I said, guys, I don't don't know what we're looking at for the fall as we were starting to plan this out, but I just said, this passage is speaking a lot to me about the way that I'm seeing this in a unique way than I've ever seen it before. And so we decided together that 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 was going to be a focus for us. What does it look like to rise up like Lazarus? And so as we launch into this, I just encourage you, we're going to look at the challenge and the process that happens in the midst of this passage. 
But I want to encourage you to truly hear from the Lord today. To understand that as we understand his scriptures, that you would hear in your own heart, God, what do you want to speak to me? Wherever you are in, in that process of challenges that lead to these Lazarus moments, what's God wanting to speak to you today? So if you want to grab your Bible, I'm just going to pray. And we're going to dive in. So Father, we come to you again. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, would you discern this into our hearts? Would you help us to hear this passage afresh and anew if we've heard it before? If we've never understood this passage before, may you speak it to our hearts. And may we be transformed by what you say to us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So what's the anatomy of a Lazarus moment? What's this process look like? And it's just three simple steps to the process. The first one is a challenge. A challenge. We experience challenge in our lives. And so we're just going to read through the passage, and I'm just going to stop at certain points and make some comments here. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and our sister Martha, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So we see in verse 3 here, we see the challenge that has come up in their life. Mary and Martha reaching out to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Their brother's sick, and in that day and age, if you're sick, this could easily lead to something far worse. And so it's this dangerous situation. Hey, he's sick. Can you come? And they're reaching out to Jesus because they know that he can heal the blind and he can reach into the lives of the sick. So we go to verse 4 and we find out that says, This sickness will not end to death, Jesus said, but it's for God's glory so that God's Son might be glorified in it. And this is kind of getting to the heart of the purpose of this passage. In some way, this passage is meant to illustrate who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. So look at verse 5 and 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. You can't tell me the, the Bible isn't humorous sometimes, right? Even unintentionally so, right? Listen to what it says. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Doesn't that sound kind of weird? Like, it's the equivalent of, like, now Justin loved Janelle and, and Judah and Josiah, so when he heard that sewage was backing up into the house, he stayed on the golf course for a couple more hours, right? <laughs> like, it's, it sounds like that. Now, now, the reality is that Jesus, he had to stay a couple more days for a purpose, and we're going to discover that purpose, but when we think through the, the timeline and the traveling that we might not understand by just reading it, what would have happened is had he left right away, he, Lazarus still would have been dead by the time he got there. It would have taken him two days to travel there. But he had a purpose for waiting, and, it, and, and that wasn't an effect. It's not that he didn't love Martha and Mary and, and Lazarus. In fact, part of the reason he loved him was to show them this. And sometimes this one encourages us. Sometimes in the waiting that we're doing, we feel like Jesus doesn't love us, but that's not it. He does, but we can't always see the bigger picture. We can't always see the bigger picture. Verses 7 to 10, he goes, says, we got to go back to Judea, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back. And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see this by the world's light. It's when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. He's basically saying, Guys, I understand this is dangerous, but no matter what happens, I need to do what the Father has called me to do, and I need to follow this pathway that the Lord has set before me. So after he'd said this, in verse 11 there, after he'd said this, he went on to tell him, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. These poor disciples, right? Every time you read about them, it's because we know the other side of the story. We're often like, guys, are you kidding me right now? Like Lazarus gets resurrected, right? It's obvious to us because we know the other side of the story. And there's something in the Bible when you're watching this that you just feel like, oh, these poor disciples are never getting it. He's not asleep. He's dead, right? But it struck me. There's something important to realize about that because, you see, you're not on the other side of your story. See, if you and I were like the disciples being in the middle of the story, we would also not be able to see what was going to happen next. 
And we look at the disciples because we know the other side of the story and we say, they're poor souls. I wonder what we'd say about ourselves because you know as, as much as I know that there's been situations that we've been praying and wrestling and, and trying to go through this whole thing. On the other side of it, we're like, oh my goodness, if I just would have known this, I would have just been totally at peace because this got worked out that way and that got worked out this way. And if I would have known that, it would have changed the situation, Right? We're so wrong so often. And so before we go judging the disciples for the reaction, I wonder what that says to us as well, that how we understand these challenges that we're, we're in the midst of. So then he told them plainly, it says in verse 14, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there so that you might believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So that you may believe, again, another point of this passage, that that the disciples might believe, that those around might believe. So this section summarizes, these first 16 verses, it summarizes the challenge that Martha and Mary are facing. Their brother is sick, sick enough that he might die. They reach out to Jesus, but he delays. I just want to speak to us right now to say for us, the challenges are inevitable and they're universal. People will get sick or hurt. Relationships will be difficult. Work will be hard. Temptations will come. And when we walk through challenges, we can reach out to Jesus because he loves us. Because he loves us. But Jesus will not always answer the way that we think he should. And that's what we find next. Instead of coming and healing Lazarus, Lazarus dies. And that's the next step of this process of these Lazarus moments. Challenges lead to death. That sometimes in our prayer about situations and our hopings that the challenges don't get better immediately, they lead to death. And I want you, as we go through this section, this things that could die, I want you to be thinking about what could be at a point of death in your life. What are you experiencing that might kind of realize or, or see this way that Lazarus had actually been there and Jesus' reactions to it? Maybe for you, it's a, it's a sickness that gets worse and not better in your life or somebody around you. Maybe it's a relationship that you have lost. Maybe it's a child that has walked away from you or at least walked away from the faith. Maybe it's the death of a dream. Maybe it's a financial challenge that's not gotten better, but it's gotten worse. Maybe it's an organizational struggle that you're wrestling with that gets worse. Maybe it's work that you're trying to do that gets harder and harder and it doesn't seem to be stopping. Whatever that might be for you, the thing that has been a challenge that has gotten worse, not better, think about that as we we go through this section of Scripture. Verse 17, it says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, what's important about that? The Jews believed that the soul, for whatever reason they believed, that the soul was kind of hanging around the body for about three days. And that was something that was just in their Jewish perception. And so the importance of him staying a couple extra days is because Jesus wanted to step into that and prove to them, hey, you might have thought that this was just a resuscitation, that the soul was hanging out, but it wasn't. He was proving to them that he was more powerful than that, that he came on the fourth day when Lazarus wasn't just dead, he was dead dead. (laughs) Have you ever seen Princess Bride? Like, he's not just mostly dead, he's like dead dead, right? Lazarus is dead dead. And the only person that could raise him from being dead, dead is God himself. And so he's stepping in to show a different way of what this looks like. Verse 18 to 20, Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Mary stayed at home. Not sure why Mary stayed back, but Martha at least came to meet him in that. Verse 21-22, uh, we see that there's this repetition of something. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you have been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And you're going to hear this phrase again in a couple of verses. Jesus is saying, or Martha is saying to him, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And in our own lives, in a time that feels like death, We have a very similar reaction. Jesus, if you would have shown up, this relationship would be healed or this person would be healed or this financial challenge would be averted. But Martha also expresses faith. Verses 23 and 24, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Your brother will rise again. Martha is a little confused by it. And this is at the center of this passage. Jesus is saying, it's going to happen. He's going to rise up again. Lazarus is going to be there, but she's confused by this. And so in verse 25, what I consider to be the center of this entire chapter, 
He says this, I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? We're going to come back to this at the end, so I don't want to land here, but do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. And so what happens after this? He said, explains that to Martha, and then Martha goes and, and calls Mary. So after she had said that, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Martha calls Mary, and she sneaks away to meet the people, but the people follow her. This is going to be a public thing. This isn't just going to be around a couple people. Jesus is making sure that a lot of people are around to see what's about to happen. And in our life, when we get in these situations, God often orchestrates it so that other people are around us to see these things. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You hear this phrase again, right? Martha first, now Mary, if you had been here. But I think Martha and Mary kind of maybe expressed two different kinds of people. Martha, if you remember the story of them previously, she's more the organized, the detailed, the thinker. Mary's the emotional one that before when they were at the house, Martha was doing all the work and Mary was just sitting before. And so you see that Martha's trying to work this out like thinking-wise, analytically with Jesus to some extent. And Mary, when she comes, she just lays before him and says, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. The point is that we are different people. We all have different personalities. But at the end of the day, Mary and Martha's cry was the same. If you would have been here, they're saying. These death situations in our life often cause us, no matter how it comes out, to be like, where are you, God? What are you doing? If, if you would have been here, things would have looked different. So we get to this powerful section. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. In the simple verse, Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? In the midst of the pain, he was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled. And Jesus wept. It's one of the shortest verses in the Bible, but there's so much to it. So important. It's interesting, isn't it? Because if you think about it the way it would have actually been, Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus. So what was he crying about? And it could mean different things. I mean, it, it could be crying at the grief of just the fact that sin and death is in the world in general. It could be his sadness that his friends couldn't understand what he was about to do. It could be sadness that, that just see him, his friends grieve. But one thing we do know is that we serve a God who not only knows about pain and grief, but he has experienced it himself. And he's with us in the midst of the pain. Amen? See, other religions, their gods are far off and distant. Only in our faith did a God come near to live amongst us, to suffer and to die. For some of the situations that you're walking through, no matter how difficult, the suffering of a sick loved one, the death of a dream that you thought was from God, the suffering of a betrayal, persecution from people around you, kids who have walked away from the faith, being overwhelmed by work that's unrelenting, I cannot give you all the answers. I can't tell you exactly what God's up to or what you're going to do next, but what I can give you is the hope of John eleven thirty five, 35, that we serve a God who meets us in the midst of the pain. He knows, he understands, and he is there with you. Now, in the midst of that, the fact that God meets us in the midst of our pain, there are those that are skeptical. In verse 37, we say, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And maybe there's a part of your heart that's skeptical as well. But in these, these processes, these places where we're at death, this death level with the things in our lives, a couple of the things that, again, I don't have all the answers for you exactly what those seasons look like because they're very confusing. They can be very confusing. But a couple of things that the Lord put on my heart as I reflected on this passage and these Lazarus moments, a couple of things. One, Lazarus moments, they cannot happen without death. You see, the greatest movies, the greatest stories have the worst challenges right before the climax of the story. If you think back to the things that you have most loved about the best movies you've ever watched or the best books you've ever read, it's because it was so dark right before the light happened. 
Also, that these moments test our faith and they make us stronger. You see, when push comes to shove, this is when our true character comes out. What we actually are, what we actually believe comes out. Do you and I really believe that God is who He says He is? Do we really believe that He loves us no matter the outcome of our situation? Many times it's not until we are pushed to the depths of who we are, the questions in our lives, that these things are actually tested for us. And to be honest, not every moment will be a Lazarus moment. Some will be, I think, more often than than we think they are. Some things are going to end in death for the time being. But the real work is often not in what is happening on the outside. It's what God is doing on the inside, if we let him. I was talking to somebody recently who's extremely challenged and, and stressed out by the way their life is going right now, and I sympathize with them, and I listen to them, and I was talking through the situation with them, and I encouraged them by just saying, I'm not, I'm not sure necessarily what to tell you to do. But I said, what I do know is that these moments where you feel like there's nowhere else to turn, we have a choice. And the choices are in that midst of that moment. Will we submit to God to let him refine us, or are we going to walk away? Are we going to back out, or are we going to step in? Because if nothing else comes from these difficult moments of death in our life, God wants to refine our faith. And this is Jesus' conversation with Martha, helping you to see like, hey, there's a bigger picture here. This is going to be there to refine you. And so I just want to encourage if if, if you're in this difficult state, no matter what that looks like, don't waste the pain. Let God step in there with you because he loves you. One other thing to, to mention before we go to the last section here is that sometimes things need to die to be resurrected in the right way. Sometimes things need to die to be resurrected in the right way. We don't like to hear it, but sometimes relationships need to die in a certain way. Sometimes groups need to die. Sometimes things need to die. Sometimes opportunities in your life need to die because it wasn't in the right way and God wants to renew and rechange and resurrect the things that are in your life. Sometimes he needs to let that one relationship in your life die so that an even greater work can happen in your life or the other person's life. Sometimes he needs to let that opportunity die so that you can be put into a different place. Sometimes he needs to let something you're depending on in your life die so that you can fully depend on him. Sometimes he's letting things get worse because he has a bigger plan. But in this situation, the story was a little bit different than that. So I want to get to the last part, the the place of hope in this Lazarus moment, a particular kind of holy moment, a Lazarus moment that can often happen in our lives. And so we look at verse 38. It said, even after Jesus... Uh, Or he said, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been in there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? His command, take away the stone. Her concern, which is an obvious concern, it's going to smell really bad. But in order to see a Lazarus moment, Jesus is asking her to do something strange, and it's going to take obedience, will We trust him. Many times in our lives when we're in the midst of a situation like this, to see the miracle on the other side, we have to trust Jesus to follow him, even if what he commands us to do seems a little bit strange. Verse 41 says, So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here so that they might believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus calls, Lazarus, come out. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. It's not just that he wants to resurrect Lazarus. It's that he wants them to remove any element of death from Lazarus himself. And for us, when Jesus is ready to do this kind of moment in our life, a Lazarus moment, to to rise up, to see something that will change, a miracle in a sense, to change in our lives, it's not that he just wants to bring us back to life. He wants to take any stain of death from our lives in general. Think about how crazy this moment would have been, a dead man coming back to life. What would you have seen? What would you have thought when you were standing there and Lazarus, who's been dead for four days, all of a sudden just starts coming out with all the grave clothes on him? Like, it would be terrifying and amazing and beautiful. It's so important to understand that the same Jesus who did that then is the same Jesus we serve now. Amen? Nothing is ever too far gone for Jesus. Death can't even stop Jesus. There's nothing that Jesus cannot resurrect in your life. There's no one who has gone so far that Jesus cannot redeem them. Lazarus moments are possible today. 
The worst drug-filled, riddled criminal alive today can be redeemed. A person with stage four cancer can be healed. That person in your life who can't imagine ever, ever coming back to Jesus can be saved. The relationship that you can't imagine being reconciled could be reconciled. Will it always happen? No. But I believe that God can and will make Lazarus moments in our life happen when we expect and imagine that he can. It's not about us even doing that. It's the fact that Jesus sometimes wants to do these kind of moments in our life, but are we ready for them? Because let's be honest, for most of us, we do not expect a miracle to happen in the midst of the greatest challenges and death in our life. It's easier to sit in self-pity and apathy than it is to believe that God has the power and the ability to step in and do a miracle. And that really gets us to the point of the calling of this series, Rise Up, as we kind of close and wrap up here. You see, when we first were talking about this as a teaching theme, I thought that Rise Up was mainly a call to us to just rise up like Lazarus, to get up, to, to see that we would actually have life and that there's an element of that. But see, only God can rise us up. You don't have the power. I don't have the power to be risen up. I don't have the power to bring life into dead things. Only God has that power. So what is it actually a call of action to? Well, rise up is a call of action for a couple of things. Number one, I just want you to hear these today. Number one, it's a call to stop living with your eyes down, living in constant anxiety. See, you and I have challenges in our life that are getting worse and not better. You have things in your life that might feel dead and you don't see how it could change. Well, you can't change it on your own, but it's time to lift your eyes up with expectancy. It's time to lift your eyes up, believing that Jesus can change your circumstance. People's lives, our lives are so busy. We, many people over the summer have been away from church, and, and as I meet with them and I talk to them, there's just this look of pure exhaustion in their eyes, just this emptiness. And I just want to encourage you as we get back into the fall, we're starting to step back into this. Rise your eyes up. What can God do in my life? What can God do in my family? What can God do in our church? What can we see God do as we step into a new season that is getting us back into the rhythms that I've heard so many people talk to me about. I can't wait to get back to the rhythms of the fall. Rise your eyes up. A call to stop sitting down depressed. See, often when things go from bad to worse, we just freeze. We sit down. We sit in self-pity and depression. And the call of action is to rise up, to keep moving in the midst of whatever challenges that you might be facing. See, I can't promise you that the circumstances would change, but I can promise you that if you keep moving and surrendering every situation to Jesus, he's going to work in the midst of it. My family and I were eating uh, lunch the other day, and Janelle had these dove chocolates, and there's always these messages on the inside. This one says, no pity parties allowed, only opportunities. So that's a funny, funny way of thinking about it, but no pity parties allowed, only opportunities. There's this moment that we need the encouragement to just say, hey, whatever's going on in front of me, whatever my life feels like right now, it's time to not throw a pity party about it. I'm going to rise my eyes up to God and believe that God has something bigger for me in this season. To believe that God wants me to step into something fresh and new. And over the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear from all the ministries in our church about what God is doing around here and ways for you to step in to community, ways to step in to learn, to serve, to grow. Get up, get in, community, serve, grow, take a step. Take one step. Even if you feel like you can't take them all, take that one step to rise up and say, and even in the midst of the worst challenge I'm facing, I'm going to take a step in to community. One of the ways that's going to happen is you should have received one of these on the way in. This conference we have coming up, in the midst of a culture that, again, feels like the culture is just falling apart and fraying at the edges, that the world that we're looking at is so confused. And this Unshaken Conference is going to be an opportunity for us to really have some of the biggest voices in the country be with us during that. And we gave you this because there's a 20% off discount thing on there that they wanted to give to you as our congregation because we're hosting it to give you an opportunity to get tickets. Also, if you want to help serve and get a free ticket to be part of this, but to help serve to make the event happen, go to ehwc.org serve. That's one of the ways that we can step in as we get into the fall. An exciting opportunity for us. Finally, the call of action is the call to respond to God's voice. The call to respond to God's voice. This theme song we're going to be singing here in just a moment that you're going to hear over the next couple of weeks is by a band named Cain, and, and it's a song called Rise Up. The, the call is a calling us out of the grave like Lazarus. See, God wants to do amazing things in our lives. He's not done with us. And sometimes we fight challenge and death when we need to submit to God's call to change us in the midst of it. Because at the end of the day, whether high or low, challenge or not, we were created by God, for God, 
how we respond to him, whether in challenge or not, is the most important thing about us. Sometimes we need to let him do his work in the midst of it. So we have a, a neat opportunity here. I just want to share one last thing with you from John eleven twenty three 23 to 26. And really land here. And then we get the privilege today, actually, of, of having somebody be baptized and experiencing the waters of baptism today, which is awesome. Before we do that, I just want to land here. And we're also, we didn't mention earlier, there's going to be a reception for the Krailings over in the living room afterwards if you want to go and say hi to them. There's going to be some tables out in the atrium. One is for a discipleship class if you're interested in stepping into that. There's going to be some events. You can hear more about the men's and women's event. There's a lot of things that we can go do. But I would be remiss if I didn't come back to this place in this passage before we celebrate this baptism. John 11, 23 to 25. Again, Jesus says, your brother will rise up again. I said I was going to come back to verse 25 because at the center of this passage is Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? As we step into this season, as we continue to hear from this passage over the next several weeks, that is going to be the question that keeps coming back to this. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that you can can step into a relationship with the God of the universe through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? And that if we believe in him, we will never die. Do you believe this? God is calling each one of us to rise up. God is inviting us into a life with him full of meaning and purpose and Lazarus moments. Do you believe this? And for those of us here today, if you have never taken a step to respond to the gospel, what is the gospel in a nutshell? It's that, that we were created for, on purpose for, a purpose by God. That the world got messed up through the sin of Adam and Eve, that we were broken in our sin and death, and because of that, we could not find hope in this world. There was no way for us to be in relationship with the God who created us. And the only way that that could change is for a perfect sacrifice to really pay the penalty for that sin and for that death. But the only perfect person was God, and so God, fully God and fully man, Jesus, his son, was sent to this earth to live amongst us and then to die on the cross He didn't just die, he was resurrected three days later and that through that there was a way open that you and I could have a relationship through what Jesus said of himself. He is the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. The hope of our future salvation and all of eternity comes down to the decision that we're going to make about Jesus. Will we respond to him, to the love and grace that he's shown us through his death and resurrection? If you're here today and you've never taken that step, please come and talk to one of us so that we can help you lead. It's as simple as repenting from your sin to say, I don't want this life anymore and surrendering to Jesus Christ and saying, okay, my life is yours now. I don't don't do this anymore. It's your life and you get to take this from here on out. So if you're there today, respond to Jesus Christ. For those of us that are Christians and have been living with him, the question comes down to, are you living with expectations in Lazarus moments? Are you ready to see what God's about to do in your life, even the challenges? No matter what you're facing right now, are you ready for a season to step in and to say, I can't wait to see what God is about to do? Because I promise you, we're going to face more challenges than we know this fall. We all know about the election season and all that kind of stuff. Again, you look in the outside world, it's crazy. But I promise you that if we depend on the Lord, God is going to work in your life no matter what you're facing to see amazing blessings come about and to see Lazarus moments where we experience the goodness of God and share that with one another. Amen?